This is Risk SA TV. It's day one of the Momentum Risk Summit 2015 at Sun City. I'm with Sarah Harper, Professor of Gerontology from the University of Oxford. Uh, she is also founder of the Institute of Population Aging. Sarah, your specialization is looking at how the world is changing in terms of population and demographics. Uh, tell us a little bit about what is happening at the moment globally in different regions in terms of population. I think the really big thrust that people actually aren't aware of is falling fertility. Uh, that across the globe, women are typically having fewer and fewer children, so much so that about two-thirds of the world's countries now are near or below replacement level of around about two children per woman. And that is really changing the dynamics. Um, and why it's particularly significant is because it tends to be linked with education. The more education you have, the more you tend to choose to have fewer children, and the more women tend to go into the workplace. Uh, and that, of course, means that highly educated populations, middle class populations, high income populations, they're the ones that are beginning to reduce their size. Uh, and those parts of the world where education is not so available, particularly to women, they're still continuing to grow. Um, so, so the dynamic is very interesting. Uh, and of course, it's playing out differently in different parts of the world. Uh, so in advanced economies, that falling fertility is combined with increasing longevity. And we're shifting the average age of the population upwards. That has all sorts of implications for how long we're going to work, what's going to happen to social security, healthcare, etc. Uh, the emerging economies are are very interesting because they have a burgeoning youth bulge um, and the big question is can they convert that into what we call a demographic dividend and that's a really highly skilled workforce that can drive an economy within a modern society and they're particularly special at the moment because particularly in Asia and Latin America those populations who are of working age they're having fewer children so their consumption is not held back by lots of young children so in theory they really can start driving those economies and then probably the, com the countries which are most challenged at the moment are here uh, in the African continent where they still have very high levels of childbearing, typically between four and seven. Uh, and that um, I think is one of the real sort of focuses. Uh, how can we help women in this part of the world um, have the number of children they would like to have? Right, so I mean there's a lot of uh, buzz at the moment actually about uh, Africa's relatively young population and the possibility of uh, using this demographic dividend to our advantage. Um, and so for, uh, for South Africa, where do we fit in that trend as a slightly different kind of economy? I, I would say South Africa really has got both advantages. So, so the thing about the demographic dividend is that you have to ask, do these young populations have the education? the institutional governance, the health profiles that enable them to really go out with the kind of skills in a modern economy and drive that economy. So to a certain extent you need a lot of young energetic workers but you need it within a very highly skilled middle class knowledge economy. So here in South Africa you actually have both. You have a very strong European middle class style economy but you have lots and lots of younger workers uh, who can you know, provide the labor that is needed to drive that economy. But that is reliant on whether you can actually provide high levels of education for all your population. And, and that really, I think, is where the crunch is. But South Africa is in, in, a, is in a good place. It's good to hear. Um, having had for so long, there was such a, a big uh, concern around population size and ever increasing population size. Uh, and so it seems quite quite recent that uh, there's been this new buzz around longevity and concerns uh, that around falling fertility, etc. When we now we're talking about population growth in Africa as being a positive thing in, in terms of this dividend, etc., etc. But given the, the theme of today and the kind of risk uh, theme for the day, what are some of the risks that we should be concerned around with our particular population dynamics? I'm, I'm, I think that's very interesting. So the UN has this median population prediction. It basically says that maximum world population, which we used to think was going to hit about 24 billion by the end of this century, uh, actually is probably going to stabilize around about 10, 11 billion, and we'll probably hit that around about 2050, and then it will flatten out. And that probably will be more or less the kind of population size we can expect, at least for, say, the next century. The crunch is actually what is happening here in Africa because that is based on the assumption that all women in Africa will come down to replacement level by 2050. 
Now, across the rest of the globe, we have something called a two-child norm, that if you ask most women, how many children would you like? They say, I'd like two, a boy and a girl. And, that's the, and that is just found almost everywhere. But there is a question about whether that is the case in Africa. And some people are arguing that no, Africa doesn't have a two-child norm. It maybe has a four, five or six-child norm. And there are all sorts of cultural and economic reasons as to why that will be. So some people are arguing that the UN is actually rather optimistic in thinking that all African women, given that we have you know, over seven children in places like Niger, for example, um, whether they will actually reduce their childbearing down to two by 2050. So that, I think, is actually an unknown. Having said that, um, it, is, it is likely that most of the middle income and middle class groups here in Africa will reduce their fertility. And then it's really important that those young people have got the education to enable them to take uh, advantage of the employment opportunities. Because the other scenario is you may have a large labour pool, but that may not be a demographic dividend. It may lead to social unrest and unemployment. Um, and there are all sorts of dynamics going on uh, in that space, which, which I think we really don't understand at the moment. Right. So, so who is currently, which regions currently are reaping the kind of uh, demographic dividend? And, and can we learn anything from the way that they've done it? Well, I mean, I think there's a very interesting story playing up between China and India. So the story at the moment is that because of the one-child policy in China, and I have to say actually that most Southeast Asian countries have replicated that without any kind of enforcement, it's just that women have chosen to have fewer children. So our lowest uh, childbearing rates are now in Southeast Asia, you know, Korea, Singapore, urban Malaysia. These uh, countries all have only just above one children at the moment. Um, but basically, China seems to have this potential for a demographic dividend. And because of its education and institutional structures, people suggest it will be able to capitalize on it. And that's why China's economy has been growing. Now, in 2030, that demographic dividend, I mean, those young people will start to age. And then India takes over. So from 2030 onwards, there will be more young workers in India than there are in China. And so the Chinese are becoming a little bit concerned, like, will India then take the economic mantle and run with it? Other people are saying, does India have the potential to put the institutional structures, the governance, the healthcare, the education, to enable all those young people that are going to be in their workforce by about 2030 to drive the Indian economy in the way that we've seen happen in Asia, for example. Um, so it's, it's, it's a mixed story, lots and lots of potential. But it comes back to Africa, a lot of it is around education. I mean, you have to get basic education and tertiary education for the majority of your population because we live in a world where we need people with skills. Um, we do have a service economy, but even our service economy is becoming far more sort of technologically advanced. And, and so that, that's really going to be the big crunch. Brilliant. Thank you very, very much for your time and your insights. Okay.